the judicial system is not a parent. We should not be relying on the government to care for children. Probably wouldn't have been alive a year late after we had really? had them had it not been for intervention. We know that not everyone can be a foster parent, but everyone can do something. Hello and welcome to the Post-COVID Church. What now? The mission, energizing Christians to engage the lost and hurting in your community. Here's your host, Stuart Kellogg, author of The Post-COVID Church. Thank you for listening to what will be an inspirational story about Christians who truly live pro-life lives and a call for the Post-COVID Church to step up and help. There are almost 400,000 children in foster care right now in America. That number is growing and will continue to grow. One reason? Post row, 24 states have restricted abortion, which means more unwanted children. What was once a great campaign line, let's overturn Roe, now means the church has more of a responsibility to step up and help. I can think of each, every single one, particularly Stephen and Anaya um, and, whoa, Kai and Chloe. Yeah, they would have not survived a year after, they probably wouldn't have been alive a year late after we had really? had them, had it not been for intervention. No one knows that more than Alonzo Barkley and his wife Astra. He's a high school principal. She's a licensed counselor working on her doctorate. In the 1990s, she worked at the Alabama Department of Human Resources, helping place children in danger into foster homes. She and Alonzo married in 2000 and were having trouble getting pregnant. They became licensed to become foster parents. He and I became provisional licensed. Um, for the little boy at the time, who's now 22, and that was in 2004, correct? So when, when we got into this, we was his foster parents. Um, and of course, that led to adoption, actually. So um, about a year or so after we had him, we got a phone call um, to foster another little girl who's now 17, who we adopted. Um, so um, those two, that, the, they, they were our first foster and adoptive foster placements, and we also adopted them. We believe that because God, um, because we were obedient to God with these kids that God, that he opened my womb. So I found out four months after we picked this baby up from the hospital who we was fostering that I was pregnant. Um, and as a result, the two, the two that are adopted are the oldest and the birth children are in the middle. Um, and so we have a 22 year old, a 17 year old, um, and then a 15 year old who's about to be 16. They're only 13 months apart. Um, and then we have a 12 year old. So we, we felt like our family was complete. Um, but then there was like a tug from the Lord. Um, we started really speaking with a caseworker and she asked us about this, uh, another little boy who was seven months at the time, had some delays. Um, and we said, sure, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take him in. Um, he's now six. Um, he's adopted. Um, and, um, he's nonverbal autistic and has some developmental delays, but absolutely one of the sweetest kids ever. So after having him for six months, <laughs> um, we were flying back from Dallas for we're Dallas Cowboy fans. And we got the call, um, to foster our youngest, who's now five. Wow. Um, and so she she's five. We we really really thought we were done. Okay, when we when we had her, like we we were done. Um, and so she's now five. We got her at seven days old. Um, and she's now five. She's cleft palate. They called us and they told us that that she had a cleft. They wanted to know if it would be an issue. Um, and they knew what would be involved. Um, my family fell in love with her as well as they did Kai. And so she's had several surgeries. Um, she is our most active. Uh, we we say that every you don't really know you need a Chloe until you got a Chloe. Everybody need a Chloe in their life, has the best personality ever. Um, we were actually done, per se. Um, we actually were done. Well, we get, my daughter comes home and um, talks to us about a teen, um, that, about a teen um, young man. Um, we, were, we were very reserved at first, had to kind of pray about it. Um, I was in the middle of getting a doctorate. I'm like, well, babe, you know you're at home the most. We talked to the kids. Because he's very close in age with the other kids, but he had been a neighbor of ours. Um, and we took him in. So he has been with us for a year and a half. 
Um, he's 17 years old, um, and he's our foster son. Two birth children, four adopted children, one foster child. As a high school principal, Alonzo knows the value of a stable home. He sees the impact on children growing up without a parent or in the middle of constant chaos. That's why he and Astra embrace the opportunity to serve God, which takes a lot. Like we don't cook regular meals. Like we cook in a Sunday meal, two chickens, two bags of rice, like four cans of green beans. Like it's no joke. Like you, you cooking for a tribe. Um, it ain't just a little, little piece of something, but God always provides and, um, you know, meets the needs of what we have. And we got a good village of people around us that help. The Barclays are an extraordinary example of living the Christian faith. They fostered and adopted through the state, but the Alabama Baptist Children's Home was there to help. It's so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Thank you for having me. Haley Walker is the Southwest Area Director. For more than 130 years, the Baptist Children's Home has helped care for children in need. Across the country, there are organizations like it that support each state's monumental effort to help the almost 400,000 children in foster care. There are so many children being brought into care. There are not enough foster homes to provide for them. There are not enough workers at the state level. There is a very, very high turnover rate. And, you know, the the judicial system is not a parent. We should not be relying on the government to care for children. And so I think there are just many components about foster care that are great. We need safe places for children, but there are things that can be done better. And it is just a difficult system to work in no matter what side you're on. The Baptist Children's Home doesn't just help foster families get licensed to help. It also provides a counselor for each family. That helps supplement the support from the overworked state employees. Well, first of all, I will say pray for our children, our foster families, our workers, our systems. I mean, when I say it is a broken system, it is broken. And so I think supporting our families in prayer is one of the biggest things that you can do. And then, um, like we said, just those tangible things. We know that not everyone can be a foster parent, and that's completely understandable. But everyone can do something. You can play a part in some way, whether that's financial giving, those support services, uh, volunteer work. There are many different things that people can do to support foster care, even if they aren't a foster parent. Hello. (laughs) Before being a director, Haley was a counselor for Daisy and Wyatt McVeigh. Hi. How are you? Wyatt, nice to meet you. you Unlike the Barclays, the McVeighs decided to become foster parents after their children were born. Their first little girl was with them for two months. Then, a few months later, in June 2020, another call. Another girl, just three months old. Yeah, around that same time, of course, I'm in nursing. I'm working at the hospital. We were full, full-blown full COVID. Uh, you know, I'm trying to go through uh, working on getting a master's. Oh, and, and we're taking a baby. Wyatt is the director of critical care services at the local hospital. He and Daisy don't downplay the difficulties. Uh, so it was definitely hard. It was hard. It turned, <laughs> kind of turned our household upside down to begin with. I think it's, for me has been just my mama heart. Is is learning and navigating how to love, because you love them so much. But it is different. It is a different thing to process as a mom and to know how to do the right best thing sometimes. It's, it's hard, it's challenging, and then trying to make sure that you're meeting all the needs of all the people in your home. Um, she has some special needs that, you know, of course when you get a baby you don't know that that's down the road. Um, and so some of that has been very tough and definitely a challenge for us because it's, um, it's everything about it is new to us. We learn a little bit more uh, every day, uh, you know, about her processes and what her needs are and the best way to, to work through that. I think just realizing, but it's such a good thing and a freedom to know that God is in control. Like, I don't think I could do this 
if I weren't 100% confident that God is in control. As with the Barclays, the McVeigh's children are very much part of the process. In fact, Daisy and Wyatt say being a foster home has helped their three children mature. Luke is in the ninth grade. Uh, I'd feel like it's all about sacrificing so much. Like, you, there's still time to just be to yourself, but you still also need to help out, and you still have to, like, you have to elongate your patience. Has it made you a little less selfish? I would say definitely, yeah. <laughs> Cause they haven't really processed that the world doesn't necessarily revolve around them, so it, it makes you try to think about yourself way less and more of what can I do for this child. It's about Luke. At Luke pays attention to us, yeah. and, and I will say it's been something I've seen in him. Hey, Mom, did you get some sleep? Hey, Mom, what can I do for you? So I would say I've seen in him grow... Would you, do you say that, Luke? I would say so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he pays attention to us, and it's been really sweet to watch him care about us. The oldest, Maggie, goes to college in the fall. <laughs> How has it changed your outlook um, as far as helping others, knowing uh, what she's gone through, the fact that she had to be placed in foster care? Yeah. I feel like you meet people just in your everyday life, it kind of changes your perspective of you're not sure what they've been through. And, you know, because you can't tell right off the bat that she's what she's been through. I don't know. You're just, you're not, you're not ever really sure what other people have been through, I guess, because they, they might not look like they've had trauma in their past life, but they definitely have. Aside from the emotional costs of raising a foster child, there are, of course, financial issues. Now, every state provides support, and it varies, but the 50-state average is about $600 a month per child. As any parent knows, that doesn't come close to covering the cost of raising a child. So you've got your shirts up here. Shorts are down here. Here's 2T. Divide That's why Daisy helped set up Fostering Together in her home county. And shoes. What size? Based inside Faith Family Fellowship Church in Spanish Fort, Alabama, the rooms are filled with racks of clothes, shoes, and items such as baby seats, that any foster family can access. And we sort donations all year. We switch it out from fall to spring. Nancy Swaggart is working today, helping a mom with six children pick out clothing for her newest foster child, a baby. There's several churches that we partner with that are huge and vital, both in volunteers and in donations. Um, so we do drives for new underwear, new diapers, that kind of thing that we don't get a whole lot of donations in the box for. So they come help us out and do drives at their own churches. Faith Family Fellowship readily agreed to host this site. Volunteers like Nancy and Daisy work at the shop. A team of about seven volunteers and we all volunteer our time and we have a distribution center now. So parents are able to come in and shop for free. Um, for clothing and shoes and diapers and formula and cups and um, toothbrushes. toothbrushes. And we, yeah, we do make sure every child, when the foster family comes in with a new placement, they get um, a backpack. And that backpack has personal products, um, a Bible, if they, will, you know, if they would like for the child to have a Bible, a stuffed animal that's new, and a new blanket. And they get that, and the family gets a meal to take home that night, a frozen meal that we've prepared, because it's hard when you get that first kiddo for the first day. And so they can come back in as often as they need and get the resources that they need for free if they're licensed. Demand is exploding. This is a perfect example of where the church must step in to help. Restricting abortion will result in more lives saved and more need. Back in Enterprise, Alabama, Astra and Alonzo matter-of-factly talk about the work they've done to save four lives. Yes, uh, Stephen, the first one, was found on his mom's lap in a ditch. Is that correct? They were walking in a ditch, and she was drunk. <laughs> um, Anaya's, Anaya's mom did crack up until birth within uh, 24 hours of birthing her. And she did it the whole time and still didn't stop years after. Um, Kai's mom withheld food from him. And he, I think, three-month visit, I think they took him because she was she was killing him. And because he was nonverbal, you know, had autism, it, it, it I mean, he all he did was just kind of lay there and make these 
weird cry sounds, but it wasn't like a cry. It was just something else. And he learned helplessness. And so that's why he would just lay. And you said and, Chloe, um, Chloe also was in danger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, she, her mom, um, just from neglect, uh, three or four of the children, and she had one with her, and he was very aggressive. Alonzo and Astra's church family members have been an amazing support, something they appreciate and believe it's critical that Christ followers step up and help in many more ways. I think we're, like he said, the church don't fully understand. They just like to say, oh, my God, Astra and Alonzo are very good people, right? Um, But it is a calling. And so I think that if, if I had to say one thing I think that the church could do is that is, you know, like, Instead of just feeling like we're called to it, they may not be necessarily called to it, but they can help in ways. Right. So like rather that's, hey, how can we help? How can we help with the meal? Right. Um, How can we help maybe showing up to a game? Um, Because when you have a family, um, you got to remember each foster child, each person, each little person that come into your life, um, you want to get them involved. Um, We've tried to make a, a transition to where. Um, nobody's left out. So we feel like everybody should be involved in something. Um, we, we made a pact years ago that no matter who comes in the family, that everybody was going to be able to, to do their activities. We were going to work together as a team. So I think as a church, sometimes it's like, Hey, you know, um, what can I do? Right. Yeah. You can go and sit at a game, right. You can root my child on while we're having to run and go watch the other one play. So I think just I think as a whole, instead of seeing us as like heroes or you guys are doing such a great, great job for the ministry, you guys are just y'all are just God, you know, sent. And it's like, OK, but you can be a part of that. God's as a body of, of believers. If you can't do it, how can you get engaged? Not everyone can make the sacrifices the Barclays and McVeighs have made opening their homes to the most needy, but everyone can step up and help. Just thinking about if you if you know a family, take them a meal, especially mm-hmm. if a lot of these families have multiple, multiple kids in their home. And a meal goes a long way. Mm-hmm. A night out goes a long way. Babysitters are hard to come by because a lot of times, you know, your kids, you've got lots of different kids, ages, needs. Just a couple hours for dinner is huge um, mm-hmm. just to encourage their hearts. Um, one thing that I would highly recommend if you say I can't have children in my home full time, but you're willing to go through the classes is to be a respite family. And that's a huge need to say, you know, I, a lot of times when foster families want to leave the state on vacation, a lot of times their foster kids can't go. They might can go, but, but likely not. And sometimes that family just needs a moment as their core family without the extra kids. And they need more families who'll say, I'll just be respite and I'll just fill in when I can, as I can for short stints. What a message the post-COVID church will send when there are loving homes for every foster child and support from every church for every foster family. I hope these stories of amazing families giving the love of Christ to the most needy inspires you and your church to do more in your hometown. Thank you for listening. I'd love to hear from you. Just write me, Stuart, S-T-U-A-R-T, Stuart at thepostcovidchurch.org. If you'd like to get my book, The Post-COVID Church, An Action Plan to Thrive, Not Just Survive, it's available in paperback and ebook at amazon.com. Thanks again for taking the time to tune in. Thank you for taking the time to listen to The Post-COVID Church, What Now? With your host, Stuart Kellogg. For more information, visit thepostcovidchurch.com. And you're invited to join the Post-COVID Church Facebook group. Please share the Post-COVID Church podcast with your friends.